right, let's open the scriptures this morning to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus 20. And in the first part of this chapter, we find God giving to Moses his commandments. Um, just the Ten Commandments that we know of them to be. Um, thou shalt love, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me, love thy God. In verse 2, don't make any graven image, all those things in chapter 20. And remember that God was, Moses was on top of Mount Sinai. God met with them on Mount Sinai. Um, chapter 19 says the whole mountain shook. The people were, they were in fear for their lives. Um, the mountain was on, on fire. The smoke was ascending to heaven. The sound of a trumpet, the Bible says, waxed louder and louder. And God came down on that mountain that day did and the people were scared to death uh, let me remind you what they said in chapter 20 verse 19 they said to Moses speak thou with, the, with us and we will hear but let not God speak with us lest we die they didn't they didn't they realized how terrible and frightful and awesome God was and they realized how <laughs> insignificant and weak and even sinful they were and they said we we don't want God to talk to us Moses we'll, we'll die if he talks to us but Moses' response in verse 20 he said Moses said to the people fear not well, that's a strange how are you going to be afraid uh, how are you not going to be afraid after all that you saw but he says fear not and here's the reason why for God has come to prove you God is here to test you to prove you to try your faith God's here uh, God has come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces. Uh, his reverence, his fear may be before your faces. And the reason is that ye sin not. We commented on uh, other services that I'm persuaded that's the reason why sin is so rampant in the world today is because people don't have a fear of God. Don't have a fear of God. Would to God that people would see where God was and who God is and all the uh, and, and everywhere that he is would would God help our country help our people see God and his holiness and righteousness uh, but I want to pick up in verse number 22 this morning we're going to look at this idea of God's instructions for worship God's instructions uh, for worship and you know God has requirements for people to worship him um, Israel, the God, they, you know, there were certain things they had to do and certain things they were not to do before they could even approach God to worship Him. And that, that's what we see in the Old Testament. And the message this morning I want to show us or try to attempt to show us how that also applies here in the New Testament. Uh, God just doesn't accept any kind of worship. He doesn't just accept any kind of worship, but God does have some requirements for that. Let's read, picking up in verse number 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. They saw it with their own eyes. They heard it with their own ears. Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. There's a little bit of a paradox in that statement, right? Verse 23. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. And that's an interesting statement. He began chapter 20 by telling them not to have any other gods before him. And we're closing chapter 20 with God telling them, Thou shalt not make unto thee 
gods of gold. But it's not too much later that Moses goes up to the mountain and gets God's commandments written in tables of stone. He's up there for 40 days, and when he comes back, what are the people doing? Worshiping an idol that they made of gold. And you know, God knew they were going to do that. He knew that. But he's dealing with them here in this chapter according to their... Uh, according to his grace, if you will. But verse number 24, God says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar. If thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now here we briefly got God's instructions uh, for worship. Um, and I want to break this down really into two, two groups. God calls his people first to sanctification. And he calls him to obedience. And then here in this portion of Scripture, he's getting ready to call them to worship. And I, I believe what we're seeing here is in the Old Testament that God's saying that before you worship me, I want you to be set apart. I want you to be sanctified, separate from this world and separate from sin. I want you to be obedient to my commandments. Then worship me. God is preparing his people here to worship him. Again, he's calling them to sanctification in chapter 19. And this sanctification that God is uh, calling his people to, or this separation, they were to separate themselves from sin. God did not want his people full of sin and practicing sin when they came before him to worship him. He said, put that stuff away from you. You can see that in chapter 19. But it wasn't just sin that they were to be separate from. Well, in a broad sense, yes, but the idea of separation is God wants his people to be separate from sin and to him. Separate from things and to him. They were to be separated from sin and they were to be separate from the world. Of all the nations in that day, Israel was to be different, was to be separate from all other nations. They would be different. Now that idea holds true even in the New Testament. God wants His people to be separate from sin. God wants His people to be separate from the world. When God looks down on the earth, He wants His people to be different from all other people in the world. He sure does. Look in James chapter 4. I want to try to reinforce that thought. If you hold your place in Exodus 20, James chapter 4. James 4. talking about God wants his people to be separate from sin and to be separate from the world. James chapter 4 and notice what James says in verse number 4. And you can tell he was, he was very conscious and, and very cautious of not offending the people by how he spoke to them, right? James 4 and verse number 4, look how cautious and soft James is while speaking to his people. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. He calls out the men, calls out the women, doesn't he? Ye adulterers and adulteresses. He says, know ye not. Don't you know this? Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. He says, don't you know this? And then he makes the statement. He says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's a very powerful statement. 
That's a statement that makes you reflect on your own self. God, am I a friend of the world? If the answer is yes, if you and I find our place that where we are a friend of the world, then we've sided against God. There's no exclusion to that. If you are a friend of the world, then you are the enemy of God. James just says that right there. And you know, John, he said something similar in 1 John chapter 3. Notice what he says here. 1 John chapter 3. I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and notice what he says in verse number 15. Love not the world. See, God in the Old Testament wanted his people to be separate from the world and separate from sin. And God in the New Testament, his standard, his requirement has not changed at all. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He tells us why. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. God's love is not in you. If you have a love for the world and the things of the world, God's love's not in you. Verse 16. For all that is in the world. Here's what's in the world. And this is the, world, this is the definition of the term world. This is what's defining it. For all that is in the world. All that is in the world. The lust of the flesh. If you have a lust, or rather, if you have a love for the lust of the flesh, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. That's, that doesn't come from God, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So James says, if we are friends of the world, we're enemies with God. John says, if we love the world, God's love's not in our heart. So God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament has a requirement for His people to separate from sin and from the world. But you see, in our Christian culture today, there's a blending, right, uh, where people say, well, we're going to bring the world and blend it with the things of God so that, we can be a more effect, so that we can be more effective in ministering and evangelizing the lost. That's garbage. It's garbage. You don't, God forbid, God's people lower their standards and, and take in the things of the world under the pretense of evangelizing and winning the lost. It doesn't work that way. You don't, when you, when you uh, suck them to that, when you lower your standards to that, you don't win the world, the world wins you. The church doesn't win the world, the world ends up winning the church, that's what happens. God wants sin and worldliness out of his people's lives. Remember in chapter 19 of Exodus, God wanted his people, we kind of summarized this, he wanted his people to be clean inside and out. Yes, he did. See, if God's in you, it will come out in your manner of living. It'll come out in your lifestyle. So God is preparing His people here in, in Exodus. He's preparing them to worship Him. And one of the things, one of the foundations, one of the truths that He's laying down first is they need to be separated from the world and from sin. That's exactly right. Now notice what else we see here in Exodus chapter 20. Not only uh, was God preparing them through sanctification, we, that's really in chapter 19, but in the first part of chapter 20, he gives them his Ten Commandments. Now, God gave his people his commandments with the, with the understanding that they would keep them or at least try to keep them. He was establishing his, um, uh, his standard of righteousness through his commandments. And we know, I don't want to get a, too far ahead of ourselves, we know that they fell short, as you and I do, of keeping God's commandments. We know that. But God gave them His commandments in chapter 20 from verse, uh, verse 1, and you could say all the way down to verse 21. But God wanted obedience from His people. He wanted them to be separate from the world. He wanted them to be separate from sin 
and separated him, but he also wanted his people to be different from everyone. He wanted, he wanted them to be different, but he also wanted them to be obedient to him. That's what, it, that's what we see, those two keys. We see that in these chapters here that God tells them, he gives that to them before they approach him in worshiping him. They're to be separate from the world and they're to obey his commandments. We can see that here. Now, that's not changed at all, but we got to remember exactly where God has just brought Israel from. They're three months into their journey out of leaving Egypt. How long had God's people been in Egypt? 400 years. Now, Egypt was a stronghold of idolatry, a, a hotbed of idolatry, right? And do you think that it's possible that during that, those 400 years, God's people may have picked up on some of those pagan or idolatrous practices? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. 400 years, their culture is, is idolatry, idols, idols, idols all around them. God's people were different. They were the Hebrews there in the land of Goshen. I understand that. But we also know that during those 400 years, some of those Hebrews intermarried with some of the Egyptians. Because there, as they, they left Egypt, as they're wandering in the wilderness, we know that many times the Bible speaks of a mixed multitude, right? So these were people that were Hebrews, but they also intermarried with the pagans, with, with the Egyptians there. And so now they had children, and they had, now you've got this family where half of the family um, is Hebrew, or half of the family um, is worshiping God, but then you've got the other half of the family that's Egyptian and pagan. And when you get a, a husband and wife like that, and they marry, and they have children, well, how are those children going to turn out? Dad's saying this way, and Mom's saying that way, right? So you've got a mixed multitude. This is one of the, you know, remember the great truth of the New Testament, the Bible says that God is not the author of what? Confusion. So here you've got two religions coming together. They're having children. How are they going to raise that child? They're going to raise it in confusion. Now that, that, that truth can be uh, applied to many things in life. So there's this mixed multitude. There, there's paganism and idolatry that the children of Israel are bringing along with them. And God says, separate yourselves from these things. And he's telling them to obey his commandments. Now, in our culture today, you, you consider this. Uh, the United States has been traditionally known as a Christian nation. Maybe somewhat of a stretch, but there's like an intermingling of beliefs in our culture today. You know, can you not see it from grandma and grandpa's generation? You know, they were more faithful to, if you will, just God's commandments, but then you've got another generation that's a little bit farther away, and then another generation that's a little farther away, and the generation that we have today. Well, they don't even know if they're male or female. They don't even know. They don't know what they are. They don't know who they're supposed to marry. They have no idea. Where, where did this line of thinking come? It's, it's, it's idolatrous thinking. It, 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 it's atheistic thinking. And so now there's a mixed multitude of people in our country. They don't, they're, they're just, they're, they're wicked in their, in their thinking. So far from the things of God, there's this blending and what a, what a mess it's brought us into today. But back to Israel. So in order for Israel to properly worship God, they had to be separated from sin and obedient to God's commandments. Separation and obedience. Let's turn to John chapter 4, if you will. Look in John 4. And, and again, God's giving his people his requirements, if you will, of worshiping him. He's leading them into worshiping. And what you'll see in the book of Exodus is God, uh, here in a few chapters later, he gives to Moses his instructions for building the tabernacle, which is a place of worship to God. And it won't be long we'll be getting into that study. But there's a, God lays everything out for a reason in that tabernacle. 
reasons. But in order for Israel to properly worship God, they had to be separated from sin and obedient to God's commands. But that's in the Old Testament. Look in John chapter 4. And I really don't think things have changed in the New Testament. Look in John 4. And here Jesus is speaking to that Samaritan woman. And she was someone who was kind of mixed in her beliefs, right? And notice what it says in, in verse number 23. Jesus said, But the hour cometh. Now let me say this. Separation and obedience is at the heart of of the kind of worship that Jesus talks about in these verses. John 4, 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth there's a lot of truth in those two verses in spirit in verse well and he says the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father true worshipers well if there's true worshipers do you know what that also implies there's false worshipers false worshipers and according to the text here it's very easy to figure out what kind of a uh, you know what a false worshiper is it's someone who's worshiping God not in spirit and not in truth right I mean that's, that's a conclusion I think. but the Lord said that they that worship him must worship him in spirit in spirit what's that mean in spirit in spirit if we're to worship God in spirit and in truth, what does it mean to worship Him in spirit? God help us when we come together and meet in this church. God help us to worship Him in spirit. What's that mean? Well, we know that it means not physically. There's a lot of worship that's focused so much on physical, right? When you see God's people in trouble worshiping idols, you can see that their worship was heavily physical, right? When Moses came down from the mount there, after he's up there 40 days, the children of Israel made that pagan idol, and the Bible says the people rose up to play. wickedness in that statement is very physical in their worship. Pagan worship, idolatrous worship, focuses much on the physical, the sensual, how you feel. God says real worship, true worship, they must worship Him. They worship the Father in spirit. It's not physical. But it's something else. It's spiritual. What does that mean? Well, it, means, it means more than just not physical. But you and I know that within you, you have a body and soul. What constitutes you is you have a body, you have a soul, and you know what else we all have is spirit. spirit. But there's an interesting truth that the Bible has about our spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1, it says, And you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? We were dead in spirit before God gave us life. When you were lost and when I was lost, our spirit was dead. It really didn't have spiritual life. It was dead in trespasses and sins. But when God saved us, our spirit was quickened. It was made alive. I think what we're seeing here is a true worshiper is born again. They're born again. Their spirit has been quickened. It's alive. Lost people cannot truly worship 
God. Why? Because they're spiritually dead. Dead. And so what do they do? They focus heavily on the physical because they don't have the spiritual. Another thing we notice in these verses, and we're trying to uh, connect this with our text in, the, in, in Exodus 20. But he says, not only do they worship God in spirit, but they're to worship him in truth. In truth. In truth. Let me back up. A person that's saved, they're separate from the world. Okay? In the Old Testament, God was one of his people who's separate from the world. A saved person is separate. They're different from the world. And not only does he say one to worship in spirit, but he says in truth. What's that mean to worship God in truth? Here this morning. We're to worship God in spirit. That means we're born again. We're saved by the grace of God. Our spirit's been made alive, quickened. It's not a heavenly, physical worship, but it's a spiritual worship. Why? Because God is spirit. But we must also worship God in truth. What does that mean to worship God in truth? It could mean, I think it also means, I mean, it can mean several things, but it means according to God's way. We have to worship Him His way. Well, preacher, I think we ought to worship God this way. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Let's do it this way. Well, the question is, which way does God say to worship Him? That's the question. Which way does God say to worship Him? Well, I don't, that's not as exciting. What you just said is, that's not as physical as I want it to be. That's why you're all messed up. That's why, that, that's, that's why you're messed up, because you want worship to be physical. It should be spiritual, spiritual. But he says, in truth, in truth, according to, it's God's way. But in truth, in, is that not in obedience to? God says this way. We're to worship him in truth. What, how, much, how much teaching, the New Testament, does the Bible tell us that we are to walk in the Spirit, to walk in truth, living in obedience to Christ's command? Often, many times, when you and I worship God, first we have to be born again, we have to be saved, we're separate from the world, but we worship Him in spirit and in truth, in truth. This morning, when we come together to worship God, are you in fellowship with God? Are you distant from God? If you're distant from God, how are you going to worship Him in truth? You come to church and you're distant and you attempt to worship Him, but you're distant. Why? Because sin. You're not obedient. And then, here, here's the danger, is it becomes this dead form of worship to God. What do you mean dead? I mean you just go through the motions. Just the motions. And it's a pretense. That's all it is. It's a facade. It's a mask. It's hypocrisy. Look, everybody. Well, who are you, who, who are you kidding me? kidding the people that you're trying to keep your image up to. But you're not kidding God. We have to worship Him in spirit truth. See, folks, when it comes to worshiping God, it is so much more than you and me. It has nothing to do with your image before your fellow man. It has nothing to do with my image before you. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with us. Get us out of the way. True worshipers, true worshipers. God help us. If we're worshiping that way, then we're false worshipers. Spirit, truth. Notice what else it says in verse number 24. God is spirit. This is John 4, 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him, notice the next couple words, must worship him 
in spirit and in truth. Must worship. This is the only way to do it, right? Must. You must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Means spirit and truth means they're together. You must worship Him. And the, if, you're, if you are to worship God, you must do it this way. In spirit, but not in spirit alone. In spirit and in truth. That's what He's saying. You have to have both of them together. You have to have both of them together. Must. There's no other way. Seems that there's a parallel between the Old Testament requirements to worship God and the New Testament require, requirements to worship God. Uh, you know, there's what, we're, what we saw in Exodus. You know, there's this God was leading them to be separate from the world and to obey His commands. And what we see in the New Testament, Jesus says to worship me in spirit and in truth. There's somewhat of a parallel there. Things have not changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But here's, here's a sobering truth. Flip, flip back over to, to Exodus chapter 20, if you would. Again, verse... 22, the middle part, it says, Ye have seen that I've talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make in you gods of gold. But notice the subject God goes to next. And this is all in the context of worship. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings. Now let me say this. There's no amount of separation and there's no amount of obedience that Israel could have practiced that would have brought them close Preacher, that just messes up everything, the whole foundation you just laid. God laid this requirement, and he laid that requirement, but you know what the truth is? Israel never measured up to God's standard of separation. They, they, never, they never measured up to God's standard of obedience. They never did. They, Israel always fell short of perfect separation. They always fell short of perfect obedience. Always. Read about it. The Old Testament, it, they're, they're riddled. They're, they're plagued from one, one event to another event to another event. You know, there was idols among them. They, they were not fully obedient. They disobeyed God over and over and over again. Yet you find God meeting with His people in the Old Testament. How? Why? Israel could not approach God on the merits of their separation and on the merits of their obedience. They couldn't. But only through the offering of a blood sacrifice. That's how Israel approached God. Yes, God laid His, his commandments out. Yes, God laid His requirements out there. Yes, be separate from sin. Be separate from the world. Yes, obey my commandments. But they never measured up to it. Yet they still met with God. And they met with God through the offering of a sacrifice. Israel's separation will be was never enough. And then, you know, it makes you wonder, then why did God require a sacrifice of them? Obviously, for the same reason that Adam, uh, Adam and Eve's leaves were not good enough. Why, you know, why was their separation, why was their obedience not good enough? For the same reason that Adam and Eve's leaves were not good enough to cover them. Adam and Eve could not approach God covered in leaves 
after their sin. They couldn't approach God to worship Him. Something had to be slain to cover their sin. Had to be. Why was Israel's separation not enough? Why was Israel's obedience not enough? For the same reason your separation and your obedience is not good enough for us to approach God and worship Him. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Preacher, how? How can we approach God to worship Him in spirit and truth if being separate from sin in the world is not enough? And if not obeying His commandments, if that's not enough, how are we going to approach God this morning? I guarantee you there's not a person here this morning that has measured up to God's requirements of perfection and separation and obedience to God's commands. There's not one of us. Is that preacher? I don't know. We're pretty good people here. And you've got some blinders on. There's evil people here this morning. What do you mean evil? Look, God, God gives the externals in the Old Testament. He, he, he gives those laws. But you know what we find in the New Testament? We see the law of Christ so much higher than the law of Moses. Law of Moses said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. There's an external act. God forbid it to be practiced. But in the New Testament, there's the law of Christ, which is much higher than the law of Moses. Jesus said, if a man look at a woman to lust after her in his heart, he's committed adultery with her already. It's not just an external act. Jesus' law goes to the heart. Your heart must be perfect before God. Not just your actions on the outside. Your heart. How are we going to approach God and worship Him? It's not just the externals that aren't right. that's not right. Our hearts are not right. How are we going to worship God? How are we going to approach God? Same way Israel did. To a blood sacrifice. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. We're almost through. Hebrews chapter 9. I'll show you this verse and one that parallels this verse in the book of Leviticus. Hebrews chapter 9. There's so much here. But he makes this statement about the blood in the Old Testament. He says, in almost all things, Hebrews 9, 22. Speaking of Moses and the law of Moses, he says, in almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was God's requirement that blood must be shed for the remission of sins. And he says almost the same thing. If you look in Leviticus chapter 17, we're in Exodus, go to Leviticus, next book over. Leviticus 17. what he says in verse number 11. He's talking about the blood again. He says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's true. If you don't think it's true, drain your blood and see how much you live, right? Well, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, look what God says about the blood. And it's speaking about the, the, the blood of the offering. He said, and I have given it, God gave it, and I have given it to you upon the altar. Why? Why has God provided this blood in the Old Testament to Israel? To make an atonement, a covering, an atonement for your souls. He says, this is, this is it. He says, it is. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's not your separation. It's not your obedience. But it's that gift that God gave makes an atonement for your soul. Gift, that awful blood. And that's how it was in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, I just want to bring a couple truths together. If you will, Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. 
moving to a lot of different places, but I want to look in Titus, and then maybe in 1 Peter 1. Titus 3. For Israel, no amount of separation, no amount of, be of obedience could bring them to true worship before God. It could not bring them into the presence of God. An offering had to be made. Folks, in the New Testament, there's no amount of separation. There's no amount of obedience that you and I can give to God. There's no amount that we can offer to God to bring us into God's presence and worship Him. There's not. But the only thing that can bring us before God is an offering that was made on our behalf. And let's just, let's just get a little context in Titus chapter 3. Look at the instructions. He says, put them in mind. This is Paul speaking to that young pastor, Titus. He says, put them in mind to be subject to principal, principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. Now, it's, this is the instruction to the church, right? Paul's telling Timothy, teach your folks this. Keep the, put them in mind to be subject. Folks, we ought to obey the laws of the land. To be subject to the principalities, powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man. That's instruction to the congregation. Don't speak evil of no man. To be not brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Not just the people you like, but to all men. For we ourselves, this is why, this is why our behavior should be such. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And we can say amen to that. That's how we were. But, verse 4 says, after something changed, after that, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And notice we're talking about we cannot be separate enough. We cannot, obe we cannot be obedient enough to approach God in worship. But verse 5 says this is how it's done. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yes. And 1 Peter 1.18 says this, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, this is 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, uh, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. How are we to approach God? Through the sacrifice of His Son. How are we to worship God? Through the offering of Jesus Christ. When we come together and meet here at Midway, we meet to worship God in spirit and in truth. How's that done? No amount of clean living will bring it. But being born again, stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Where are you at this morning? Are you distant from God? distant.